Hello and good day. Uh, my name is Byron Cheatham, and I'm Senior Vice President at Site Aviva, along with my colleague, Jamie Ertz, who's Senior Manager for Technology Development at Site Aviva. And today we're going to spend about 20 minutes uh, reviewing some data regarding the use of Site Aviva's hyperspectral microscope uh, for the uh, identification and spectral characterization of upconversion nanoparticles uh, that are utilized uh, in a wide range of developing applications in uh, biotech as well as uh, in a number of material science related applications. Um, so let's give a few details of the webinar very quick this morning and, and uh, in this afternoon uh, in terms of uh, the, the specifics. It'll be approximately 20 to 30 minutes long. We've muted all phones during the webinar. However, we would ask that, that uh, any questions that you have about the data that we present today, if you would please submit those questions to info at cytoviva.com. We will be pleased to answer your questions uh, and work with you in any way. Also, as you could see earlier, we're recording uh, this webinar today, so we'll provide this recorded version to you as a link uh, from the web so that you can re-review the data again if you like and or share it with colleagues as appropriate. Um, very quickly, we, we wanted to make sure that everyone on the webinar has some insight with regard to Site Aviva and, and what we do. Site Aviva is a private uh, imaging company that's based in the southeastern U.S. Uh, and uh, is approximately 10 years old and was developed to commercialize optical and spectral imaging technology uh, specifically for uh, nanoscale related research. With that, I want to very quickly just transition into the side of EVA technology that we're going to be talking about today. And while our principal focus today with the side of EVA integrated optical and hyperspectral imaging technology is focused on upconversion nanoparticles and the ability to identify these nanomaterials. Uh, spectrally in a wide range of environments, it's important to note that these very same optics and spectral imaging tools that are integrated work with non-upconverting samples. In fact, that's the principal focus of our business. So we'll show examples of non-upconverting uh, nanoparticles as well as quite a bit of data related to upconversion today as well. Um, our technology is, is an integrated dark field based optical microscope uh, with hyperspectral imaging. So we're going to share some details about dark field microscopy and hyperspectral uh, imaging on the dark field microscope, specifically as it relates to upconversion nanoparticles and how it works. But our patented dark field microscope optics create a very high signal to noise image whether we're utilizing broadband optics or whether we're using uh, coherent light uh, in lasers, such that we're able to get in broadband a very significant scatter detection from nanoscale materials or when we're using, for example, a 980 laser through the dark field system for up conversion, we see an increased sensitivity through using the dark field system uh, with the 980 laser uh, to be able to excite and see emission from upconversion nanoparticles. And so with hyperspectral imaging on a dark field microscope, two things uh, become readily apparent. First is that you're able to see um, the actual image as a hyperspectral image uh, in dark field uh, after it's been completed. And you're able to collect the spectrum in every single pixel, in this case, of the upconversion image such that if I have upconverting nanoparticles in a sample and I can identify the spectral response, which with upconversion emission is very specific, I'm able to identify upconversion uh, emission anywhere in a sample using hyperspectral imaging, whether it's present and easily obvious uh, to my eyes through the microscope or even from the hyperspectral image, yes or no. And we'll explain how that works as we go through it. So the key benefits of this technology, specifically as it relates to upconversion, is first of all the ability to optically image samples containing upconverting nanomaterials. And you can do this using both halogen uh, full spectrum illumination 
as well as 980 uh, laser illumination. And that can be important because if I capture a hyperspectral image first using halogen uh, light, and then I capture a hyperspectral image using 980 uh, excitation, I can link the two displays together so that in halogen mode, I'm able to see what the sample looks like in the full context of the sample, what's up converting and what's not. But then by having the up conversion sample uh, image next to it, I'm able to see the up converting nanoparticles in their spectrum uh, uh, at the same time, such that I'm able to then conduct analysis to be able to spectrally map up conversion materials anywhere in the sample where they exist. So I want to illustrate very quickly what the microscope configuration looks like that does this. And it's important to note that while we talked about uh, sending a 980 signal through our, our enhanced dark field illumination system on the microscope uh, and getting enhanced sensitivity to the, uh, to the upconversion emission, if you are working with samples that have an opaque substrate such that we can't get transmitted light through, you can also use standard reflected light optics on the microscope for the optical path of the, um, of the uh, laser light. So for up conversion, I'll share with you the, the optical path very quickly and a little bit about how the system works. First, we see uh, that we have a laser source illumination uh, here uh, where the cursor is. That laser source feeds via light guide into the dark field illumination system that we're going to share some more details with, which goes up uh, through the optical path, through the sample and the optical path of the microscope, uh, to uh, either a 950 nanometer short pass emission filter or you could use a short pass emission filter that started at say 700 or 725 nanometers depending on the types of samples that you're looking at and other details. Then the emission is recorded onto the diffraction grading spectrograph and the camera and that's fed to image analysis software so that we are able to collect a spectral image or a hyperspectral image such that we can measure the spectral response in every single pixel of the image to identify in a quantitative way the up conversion signal. So before we uh, share more details about up conversion, we want to make sure that we, we have a chance to share with you the details of these patented enhanced dark field microscopy optics which really do two things. They, they provide more laser energy on the upconversion nanoparticle samples that are on a glass substrate, as opposed to using standard reflective optics uh, that we typically see. Also, it provides up to a 7x increase in detection of nanoscale samples when you're using broadband illumination. I think there's a strong possibility that many of the people that may be on this webinar this morning and we know that many research labs around the world that are focused on upconversion nanoparticles are also focused on synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials that aren't upconversion, be they noble metal nanoparticles, carbon nanotubes, metal oxides, et cetera. So these patented dark field optics provide significant advantages for both types of, of, uh, of, of samples that you might be using. And they work by simply improving the light efficiency of the optical path of dark field or oblique angle illumination and providing the ability to focus this oblique angle illumination or dark field um, in a very fine way such that the oblique angle illumination, which has an angle of attack on the sample of about 65 to 75 degrees, uh, can be focused in a highly uh, measured way such that you're able to put those photons specifically on the z-axis of the focal plane that you need to, which in the case of nanomaterials is always going to be a very, very thin shallow focal plane in most cases. So to show you an example just using broadband illumination, if you look at uh, these 240 nanometer uh, polystyrene beads, if you compare standard dark field optics using broadband, you see the image on the left, However, when the same sample, a different field of view of the same sample is imaged utilizing the side of either enhanced dark field illumination optics, you can just from a qualitative perspective see a significant increase uh, in the signal to noise. And that's very important if you're trying to capture a hyperspectral image either of nanoparticle scatter 
or if you're looking from a mission uh, that's put off from the excitation. And here we're showing an example of a gold nanoparticle that's imaged using the site of Viva uh, dark field optics in hyperspectral imaging, and the very same gold nanoparticle uh, using standard dark field optics captured via hyperspectral imaging. What you see here is that the increased signal to noise from the side of EVA enhanced dark field optics produced a dramatic increase in both signal and a dramatic decrease in noise, as you can see qualitatively from the hyperspectral images on the top, but more quantitatively from the spectral response that's measured of the identical pixel of the identical particle, only changing the microscope optics. So with that, we want to transition into hyperspectral imaging and make sure that everyone here has an understanding of what hyperspectral imaging is, is and how it works. So at Site of Eva, we have the ability to mount onto the C-mount or camera mount of the microscope a visible near-infrared or shortwave infrared diffraction grading spectrograph that you see here as the black object with an integrated uh, CCD or EMCCD, or in the case of the shortwave infrared, an in-gas detector. So by integrating uh, the detector onto the spectrograph, that's the mechanism that's used to create the, the spectral image. And so the mechanics of the spectral image and how it's created uh, rely on the image analysis, the hyperspectral image analysis software integrated with the detector and with an automated stage to push the sample across the field of view of the microscope optics and the diffraction grading spectrograph and detector to build a hyperspectral image, pixel row by pixel row. So uh, depending on the exposure requirements of the detector, uh, the field of view area that you want to try to capture, you can capture a hyperspectral image anywhere from seconds to minutes, typically. Uh, and then once that hyperspectral image is created with spectral data in the Wiener from 400 to 1,000 or in the shortwave infrared from 900 to 1,700, in every single pixel of the image, the image is ready for spectral query in every pixel immediately in the image analysis software. So as we talked about earlier, we can capture either this near-infrared spectrum from 400 to 1,000 or shortwave infrared spectrum from 900 to 1,700. In the case of up-conversion nanomaterials, since typically the source illumination is a laser in and around the 980 nanometer range, uh, and the, the very nature of the up-converting nanoparticles are such that they emit in the visible range, a uh, viz near-infrared spectrograph, either equipped with a standard CCD or potentially with a, an EMCCD detector, would be the one that's most likely utilized. And with the hyperspectral images, you see using just broadband halogen here, um, the data is presented as a full RGB, red, green, blue image, and the spectra can be queried from each pixel in the image. So as we're looking at this image of live red blood cells, again using halogen illumination in this case, the green areas are 50 nanometer gold particles. Uh, the particles appear green because in the case of halogen illumination and plasmon resonance associated with the gold particles, they produce a very narrow half-width peak as is represented here from this single pixel observation of the gold particle in the image in the 550 nanometer range, which is green. So, as a result, the materials appear green uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, image, uh, and that's represented by the spectral response. By capturing all of this data at very high spectral resolution, down to about two nanometers of spectral resolution, you're able to easily identify up-converting spectra or even using broadband to capture the spectral response of materials that are illuminated with broadband and detailed quantitative analysis, such as the ability to identify specific signals, for example, emission signals from up conversion in every single pixel of the image, very rapidly and very accurately, even if you can't see them with your eye, is very possible using uh, hyperspectral imaging. So I want to give an example, and this will be the last example that we use using broadband halogen, but it 
I want to make sure that I, I, I provide some examples because I know that, that non-up conversion particles are a big part of what a lot of people do. But here we're looking at an image of gold nanoparticles uh, that have been conjugated uh, into a mammalian cell culture. And here at the top right, we see library spectra that's been captured from the gold particles in the cell. And by using a spectral mapping algorithm that's uh, inherent in the hyperspectral image analysis software, we're able to map every pixel in the image that's an exact match to the spectral library of, in this case, gold in the cells. So every pixel that contains gold in the cells is mapped red in this case. And we're able to provide a class distribution that illustrates the number and percentage of pixels in the image that map for the gold particles. And while we're showing gold using halogen, the same process is going to apply when we're looking for up conversion emission in whatever environment that we're looking at. So with that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, uh, Jamie Hertz, and Jamie is going to provide some more details related to up-conversion samples uh, and how hyperspectral imaging can work with that. So go ahead, Jamie. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, this is Jamie Hertz with Sadaviva, and uh, as Byron mentioned, I'm going to be explaining a couple of slides here that, that show actual examples of some uh, up-converted material. And this particular sample here is a, a reflected light application. And this was done by using um, a 980 nanometer laser along with just broadband halogen light to provide these two images on the left and on the right. And if we look here, we see the image on the left has uh, an arrow that points to the halogen emission spectra in which this particular pixel in the image shows. And so we see here that this uh, spectrum is kind of broad. And then on the right, this is the exact same sample, except this is um, using the 980 nanometer laser for excitation. And then in the uh, turret of the microscope, there is an emission filter that blocks the laser light, and in fact, it blocks all light above 700 nanometers and only allows light below 700 nanometers to, uh, to pass. So here on the right, we see uh, this, these particles uh, represented in green uh, are the particles in which uh, were shown to have up conversion properties. And so here uh, on the left, we see the pixel and the spectrum, and then on the right, the same pixel and the spectrum here, and we see that this particular, these particular particles that were um, on the surface up-convert here and have a peak of around uh, 500 and uh, I think it was uh, 32 nanometers or so. And they have another peak uh, out here right around 680 or so. And so these two sp pixel spectra are from the exact same pixel on the exact same scan. One was just done in halogen light and one was just done uh, using the 980 laser for uh, up conversion. And so here we've just linked these two images together using the software. To, and simultaneously, you can move around this whole sample. And this will move in conjunction with this crosshair. And it will show this correlating spectrum in each window. So this can actually give you an idea of, of which pixels are, have particles that are up converted and, and, and which ones don't. Uh, so going to this next sample here, this was a, um, a different sample, and these particles, these are just particles. Um, and so here in, on the left side, we have just the up-converted image. Uh, this image here is just the particles that have up-converted, so obviously the dark area between the green areas are it's blank space. It's just uh, areas that, you know, light just passed by and uh, there was nothing there, so there was no up-conversion happening. And then on the right, we see a similar-looking image, but in red. And what this actually is, is using a spectral matching software uh, algorithm in the software. Uh, this particular algorithm is called Peak Location Classifier. Um, it, you're actually able to store the spectrum here of what the up-converted particles look like. This is a, the spectrum from these up-converted particles. And then 
you can show everywhere else in the image that this uh, exact spectrum exists. And so here on the right is just uh, what we call a, uh, a, a mapping image or a mapped image. And in the software, it's actually called a classification image. And this is just an image that shows pixels uh, either uh, black or colored. And in this case, we colored them red. And so where black pixels are, there's no signal here. There's, the signal does not exist. And where red pixels uh, are in the image, uh, it's where this spectrum does exist. And then down here on the right, we can even get some more information like class distribution. And what this does is this gives you the uh, percentage and also the number of pixels mapped as opposed to unmapped, meaning pixels that were classified as upconverted particles and pixels that wasn't. And so in this particular image, out of 262,144 pixels, um, we have 226. 1,379 that are not classified, and the rest, 35,765, are classified. And this peak here, in this, in this example, uh, this peak was at 540 nanometers. And so now I'm going to go to the actual data cube here in Envy. And so this is the Envy software here, and we see that uh, over here, this is the actual image of the upconverted particles. And so what I wanted to show you here real quick is just um, what the spectrum looks like from an actual pixel here in the image. And as I'm moving the cursor around, we see this spectrum intensity might change, but the, but the signature is, is, is pretty, it's pretty consistent. Now I'm, now I'm actually getting off of the signal here and as I come back onto a particle here, we, we see the upconverted signal uh, finally get some intensity and some structure to it. And so here, we've actually done the uh, classification mapping for you. And so this tool here allows you to turn on the pixels that have been classified. And so here, at 542 nanometers, these, these pixels have been... Uh, located in the image of where they exist. And, and this, uh, this, this algorithm works off some parameters that you input, such as um, what intensity threshold does the data have to reach for it to be classified as a particle. So, so here, for example, in this particular particle, we see this peak here is of about 5,000 intensity units. These, this uh, y-axis here is value. This is actually the dynamic range of the camera, of the detector. So this goes from zero to about 15,000, and then the data starts to clip. This is a 14-bit camera. Uh, so we probably here set a threshold of around uh, maybe 1,000, meaning any signal below 1,000 is probably too noisy. So um, it's, a, it's a user input um, parameter here. So, so anything above 1,000. Uh, we said would be classified if it has a peak at 542, and so this is what we see. And if we want to, we can even go into these uh, classifications and get these distributions like we did before. And as we see, these are the exact same numbers that we saw in the last image. But the, this will give you what's been classified and what has not been classified. And then um, all of this data can be exported to ASCII file and, you know, imported into whatever image analysis or statistical analysis tool that, um, that uh, you would like to use. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, so we wanted to provide just this really brief overview of the ability to use hyperspectral microscopy as a way to be able to identify upconverting nanoparticles. And so we've shown some really basic examples here this morning of upconverting nanoparticles principally that are just on a slide as sort of proof of concept. So, I mean, everyone on the call probably has some insight as to the potential advantages to upconverting nanoparticles. One is, is that by using 980 and related excitation, there's deeper penetration of the, of the excitation signal, for example, into tissue. Uh, there is the ability to have less photobleaching, of course, with upconverting nanoparticles as opposed with traditional fluorophores. And also the upconverting nanoparticles produce more specific uh, wavelengths, so it's easier to identify them as opposed to other materials which may be in the sample. But the idea is, is that these are really new materials in terms of, in terms of the development and application. 
And hyperspectral microscopy, we think, represents a fantastic way to try to be able to understand not only when you're synthesizing these materials, how effective you are in the synthesization process, but it's also an excellent tool to help you be able to identify the presence of upconverting nanoparticles, whether they're integrated in biologicals or any other type of material matrix. Because unlike traditional fluorescence, whether it's confocal or FE fluorescence or whatever methodology that you might use to try to identify uh, traditional fluorophores, um, the ability to use hyperspectral to identify these highly stable fluorophores, even in very, very small spatial areas, a single pixel in one of these images may be as little as 128 nanometers, that potential exists. And so because of that, we think that uh, it has tremendous utility in the development of upconversion nanoparticles. And we would be pleased to work with anyone who's either synthesizing and testing and characterizing upconversion nanoparticles and or is using them in any environment. So we appreciate your time uh, this morning. Uh, and as I mentioned, we will uh, provide you with a copy of this recorded webinar. We would also be pleased to work with you on any level if you'd like to learn more about how hyperspectral imaging may work, not only with your upconverting nanoparticles, but also other nanoscale materials that you might be working with. So please contact us at, uh, from our website at sideofiva.com or send us an email at info at and we would be pleased to work with you. And thank you for your time this morning.